Well, I suppose not all of 2020 could be peaches and cream. Believe it or not, this has been a tough year for an industry that's built entirely around performance for a live crowd. WW have, to their credit, managed some absolutely wonderful pay-per-view matches this year. I'll be letting you know some of my favourites this Sunday. What a tease. But it truly is hell trying to get into heaven. And before we can bask in the glory of 2020's best wrestling, first we must do the main roster version of basking in the glory, which is changing the glory's theme music and asking it to wear a dorky shirt for no reason. It's a Keith Lee reference. Merry goddamn horrible annoying bastard Christmas everyone, here are the 10 worst WWE pay-per-view matches of 2020. Number 10, the Women's Elimination Chamber match, Elimination Chamber. Right, okay, right, let's start with the really divisive one. So just to say up front, as an angle to get over the blood-curdling terror of Shayna Baszler, this worked really well. However, angles don't normally last 21 minutes. If this was the first step of the journey to probably still today Raw Women's Champion Shayna Baszler, it would be more palatable, but seeing as Becky Lynch retained at Mania in a decent but underwhelming match, this Elimination Chamber match is aged like a fine murderer. It's just awkward. Baszler enters as the fourth combatant and wipes everyone out, and then we wait. Then Liv Morgan arrives and is killed also. Then we wait. The crowd lose their patience. Baszler can't save it with posturing. Asuka can't save it with dancing. It's just as a viewing experience, terrible. Just kayfabe the time, WWE. Just rig it. Who cares? Don't have to wait five minutes or have Baszler come in, I don't know, fifth. Kill everyone just in time for Asuka to come out. Although that would mean extending the pre-Baszler section of the chamber, which was Heatless Natalia versus Heatless the former Riot Squad, which was also mega boring. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Number nine, Bobby Lashley versus Slapjack Hell in a Cell. I mean, shrug? What do you say about this? It's a thrown together match on the day. It's a meaningless extended squash featuring a wrestler called, and it still hasn't become so bad it's good. Slapjack. Literally the only thing of note about this match is that for a terrifying force hellbent on destroying Raw via stealing a bunch of Bane costumes from the dollar store and checks notes lobbying for and receiving employment by WWE, this is at the only time of writing the only pay-per-view to have featured retribution in any in-ring capacity. Seriously, the faction's been around for four months and the only impact they've made for anyone not watching the TV shows, which is a lot of people turns out, is this weird Jason looking who gets munched by Bubbles Lashford and then Retribution turn up and Bubbles beats them up too. Next. Number eight, the Women's Survivor Series match, Survivor Series. Okay, there are definitely worse matches out there and compared to some of the Women's Survivor Series matches we had in the 2000s, this is a Rembrandt, but goddamn, no one came out of this match looking good. When you have 10 people in a match and not one person comes out of it with improved stock, that is a bad match. The whole match is a joke and I don't mean that in a snide way. Literally, the match is structured like a joke setup, development of the setup, and punchline, which is Lana won the match because lol, she's terrible. But hey, if WWE wants to use most of their women's division to tell literally this one joke and nothing else, fine, it's up to them. But WWE, why did you tell it so weird? Why did you have Lana tag in and do well earlier in the match? Literally, Lana tags in and that would fit the story if she like immediately f***s up. But she wrestles competently before her group screams at her to tag out for no reason. So Bailey looks like a chump for being eliminated first. Shayna Baszler looks like a chump for getting herself DQ'd for literally no reason. Jax and Belair look like chumps for not understanding how countouts work, especially Jax who is next to the ring, unencumbered at nine and still somehow runs away from the ring. The only person who emerges with anything is Lana, but she won as a gag. So what's she gonna do, challenge Asuka again? I, I don't know, maybe I'm just grumpy, but Bianca Belair is right there. She's right there, why won't, why won't you? Oh, f it. Number seven, Asuka versus Nia Jax. Backlash. Asuka and Nia Jax had good chemistry for eight minutes and then double count out. Why? To set up a rematch on Raw. The Asuka won after rolling up Nia, who got fast counted by the ref because Nia shoved him. That's a story worth telling over two matches. You're right. I know Nia Jax has become persona non grata to a lot of fans because of certain in ring incidents that reached a crescendo against Kyrie Sane. But even so, like. Don't waste my time. At Backlash, Nia and Asuka did the first bit of a match, but it was over before it could develop and it didn't even pay off well in the rematch, so... Number six, the Money in the Bank match, Money in the Bank. This is probably going to get me some backlash, but oh, this match blows. Cinematic matches have become the match type of the year, and just like they always do, WWE have done the best version of a stipulation and also the worst. There's a few contenders for sucky cinematic matches this year. Insanely, most of them came from NXT. The Final B and the Cold Dream match were both self-important bores with contrived stunts and nauseating editing. The Swamp Fight was also a letdown, but then there's this, the 
WWE stand-up variety hour. Now look, individual moments of this, yes, are fun. Dana Brooke is a delight. Asuka before the dancing got bad. Styles suffering from PTSD. But there's just such a wall of irreverent, I'm so random wackiness and actively damaging character work that is a genuine chore to watch. Alistair Black participating in a food fight sucks. Vince McMahon, the most OTT character in the history of wrestling, just being a bit startled in his office sucks. Just randomly panning to a random doink because real doink is dead. WWE painting itself as a lulzy carnival house instead of this ruthless corporate titan that lays off a significant percentage of its workforce in a pandemic when it didn't have to. That sucks. And then it gets the payoff, the big hook of the match, the stuff on the roof. And it's genuinely terrible. Half the wrestlers don't show up. Baron Corbin murders two of them that do, which is handled in such a weird, cold, matter-of-fact way. Asuka wins after stopping Corbin, which doesn't make sense because he's not going for her briefcase. And then Otis wins via prop comedy. And then neither Asuka or Otis got to cash in afterwards. I'm only halfway through this list. Number five, Elias versus King Corbin, WrestleMania 36. Poor Elias, what a year for the lad. The first victim of Brock Lesnar in the Rumble, pushed to his death by King Corbin doing his best scar impression, hit by a car and also he wrestled in two of the worst pay-per-view matches of the year first there was the hot nothing against jeff hardy at hell in the cell only there to cool down a crowd that didn't exist after uso and reigns before jeff club is elias with a guitar again like jacks versus asuka a crappy non-finish in order to sell a rematch on tv wwe's single worst habit right now but hey at least it happened in the thunderdome worse than that is elias versus king corbin a match that will go down in history as having happened at wrestlemania a completely heatless affair going back and watching this match take place in silence before WWE had worked out how to at least inject some crowd life into their COVID shows. Oh man, you can feel your skin crawling and your hair growing. That's how boring it is. I don't know if both men deserved better, but none of us deserved that. Fun fact, Elias versus King Corbin actually went 30 seconds longer than the built for months Shayna Baszler versus Becky Lynch. What a world. Number four, Edge versus Randy Orton, WrestleMania 36. Speaking of match, length oh man this one hurts it really does edge is so great orton's had one of the best years of his career for a match kneecapped by insane marketing the greatest match ever was pretty damn good this was a 35 minute slow moving loud grunting exploration of the performance center with a brief visual echo of chris benoit's suicide that god let's just hope it was unintentional the whole thing is walk and brawl and honestly before you get to the emotional ending with both men weeping like they're in a school production of mice and men here are the memorable moments the rkos at the beginning that was good the chris benoit thing edge doing a weird first jump onto orton from a bit of gym a table spot and that's it 35 minutes and that's it the rest is just so boring watching it back i just kept clicking the advanced 10 seconds button on the network just kept clicking and nothing was happening i'm sorry i really wanted this to be good i really did god damn Number three, the stupid Viking prophets thing, backlash. I promise I have a sense of humor. I super duper promise I do. This was the worst cinematic match of the year by a light year and probably the one to make everyone think, well, we're done with this. In NXT, the Viking Raiders were hugely dominant and hugely brilliant. They vacated the belts and the Street Profits won them. The Profits never beat the Raiders in NXT and then they became raw tag champs on the main roster again without beating the Raiders. There's your feud. Both these teams can go. So what happened? WWE makes them do a series of skits on Raw where they compete in ass challenges like bowling and golfing and then when it comes time for them to wrestle on pay-per-view they sack off the match for an extended comedy skit featuring ninjas, swords, bowling balls before everyone just ends up in the literal dumpster. Subtle visual storytelling there and honestly the recap on Wikipedia sums it up better than I ever could. The segment ended after both teams were spooked by a tentacle creature. The announced team then confirmed the Raw Tag Team Championship match would not be happening. Number two, Brock Lesnar versus Ricochet Super Showdown. Welcome to the last two matches. Gonna try and keep these brief because they both make me super cross. And endless whinging is not what Christmas is all about. That's what January is all about. So you've got two wrestlers. One's very big, but also incredibly good at selling for quick smaller guys. Then you have a smaller guy who is possibly also the quickest guy. You're having them fight on what is essentially a glorified house show. Ricochet really needs a boost since losing the US title. I mean, sure, no one expects or even really wants Ricochet to win, but 10 minutes of fun flips versus fun suplex seems like a slam dunk. 90 seconds long, Ricochet doesn't hit a single move, 
by. Some suplexes. Ricochet literally being picked off the mat into an F5. Plane home. Why? To tell the story that Lesnar is strong. Never told that before. I guess. All it did was make the guy who put on a stormer with Adam Cole at TakeOver and was one half of a Dusty Rhodes tag team classic winning team look like a joke. Morale. Can't buy it. And number one, The Fiend versus Goldberg Super Showdown. Just the best character in years. One who was specifically impervious to pain and Goldberg beat him with a suplex in Saudi Arabia. Like even putting that to one side, putting aside everything it says about the ass backwards, short term nostalgia poison way WWE conducts its awful business. It's just an objectively terrible. Goldberg's gassed after his first spear. He can't even hit his own finishing move. Just, I think it comes down to a call that Michael Cole makes just after the pin. Turn back the clock, he says. Goldberg is back but you can't turn back the clock. That's the point of f***ing clocks. As a match, it's dreadful, but as a handy, easy to digest summation of everything wrong with the biggest wrestling company in the world, really hits the spot. And to all, a good night. That's our list. Sorry, Merry Christmas. Sorry, just subscribe, please. Sorry, Merry Christmas.